One of them is I think there is that narrative shift that people are understanding that this is really a store of value. Although it you know has been wildly volatile, it's a long-term store of value that people can get behind. So I think that message is is happening. And I think it's a precursor to the capital that is about to enter the market. And the capital that's about to enter the market is very different to everything that's entered so far. And I'm basically talking about the ETFs. And we're going to see money go into that that ETF and they're going to lock up Bitcoin for a long time. And those holders don't care about trading and buying and selling Bitcoin. They're just going to buy it. It's going to be 1% to 2%, maybe even 5% of their portfolio. And they're going to come back in five years and look at it and go, well, how's that Bitcoin doing? And they're going to hold it for five years. And the capacity of the 20 ETFs that are, you know, in situ at the moment about to have their, you know, approvals done has the capacity to take those existing 2 million coins straight off the exchange. So I think there's going to be, it's just a, it's a, not only is it a narrative, it's a different, it's a different buyer who's buying Bitcoin now. And we're only seeing, I think, the precursor to what those new buyers look like and how they behave. So I think we're going to split this market into pre and post ETF and the, the buyers to come are going to look very different to the buyers who have been here today. Absolutely. Are you talking about sort of sneaky early adopter type institutional investors who are getting in now quietly because they've done the work and they've figured it out and they've seen that the sort of correlation between Bitcoin and the NASDAQ isn't quite as close as it used to be and that it's sort of outperformed every other asset class over the last 12 months and finally kind of been recognized across the world and they're going, okay, this thing's here to stay. Is that kind of what we're, is that what you're sort of implying with what some of the behavior might be right now? Never mind the wall of money, the big money that could come with the ETF. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I'll share with you a story. We had VJ come and talk to our clients, VJ Boy Patty, who just a great human being, uh, all around nice guy and um, just a fabulous educator. In April last year, so April 2022, give or take, uh, he came and had a chat to our clients. The question I posed to him was, what is the greatest risk for Bitcoin? He broke that down into two things and was very quick to, quick to clarify. He said, the number one risk for Bitcoin is that a major exchange goes down. Now, this was a full eight months before FTX blowing up and mm -hmm. sending the world into a cataclysm. And you know that is just the, the level that VJ operates on, just so far ahead of everyone else. And he was very quick to say that despite the fact that that will cause absolute havoc in the market, it'll be hugely detrimental to Bitcoin. The network itself will remain unaffected and Bitcoin itself will remain unaffected, but the public perception will be affected and it could be a long lasting, it could be a long lasting effect where people are put off Bitcoin and investing in Bitcoin for, you know, two to five years. What's really encouraged me over the last 12 months and what I've seen is, despite the fact that we had a catastrophic failure with FTX, which was probably the second largest exchange in the world at the time, and it did somewhere between 10 and 20% of daily global trade in Bitcoin and crypto, in less than 12 months, the market shrugged it off and said, Bitcoin's still working and Bitcoin's up 150% since that happened. That is a huge endorsement for what's mm -hmm. happening. And this is, you know, back to the narrative shift 12 months ago, oh, world's falling in, Bitcoin's dead and the rest of it. And fast forward to where we are now, excuse me, you know, coins off exchange. The last three years, we've gone from 3 million to 2 million and you can't help but start wondering and thinking what that's going to do from a, you know, from a price perspective when we've got the supply of Bitcoin on exchange literally going down. So all of a sudden it sets us up for a really nice year ahead. All right, all right. My most popular guest, Peter Dunworth, is back in the house. Welcome, Pete. It's great to be back with you, Dal. You well? Yeah, living the dream. Uh, got a couple more days worth of work. Uh, this evening had sauna and a steak, and now I'm talking Bitcoin, so it's all good. How about you? You're the richest man alive. <laughs> yeah, as, as your brother said, what like happiness is the new rich. So um, yeah, so far I'm okay. He's got a uh, point there. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I guess the purpose of today's show to kind of lay the the groundwork and set the scene for everyone is really to to have a squiz and say, what was this year all about? Let's have a look at 2023. So I had some things on my mind. You've got some things in your mind. And I'd love to just dive straight into some of those things. So 
there might be even a degree of overlap there, Pete, but I'm happy for you to sort of steer this wherever you want to go because this is your day job. And I'd love to sort of, let's start out with kind of at a high level. How would you characterize this year? And what are some of the bigger picture themes that you've seen from the outset? Oh, how would I capture this year in a nutshell? I think it's one of disbelief. I think in light of where we were 12 months ago, uh, we were looking at a catastrophic failure in the market. People conflated the failure of FTX with the failure of Bitcoin and crypto in general. I was happy for the conflation with crypto, but very protective of uh, getting Bitcoin minced in with that. There's a very big difference. But I, th I think there is um, somewhat of a disbelief in the broader market of what Bitcoin's done this year. And there's this certain sense of apathy that you know people still aren't looking at Bitcoin despite it being up over 160% off its lows uh, just on 12 months ago. So it, it is this disbelief. It's a complete lack of apathy. And I, although there's undercurrents and murmurings from the Bitcoin community that, oh, we've got an ETF around the corner and things are going to be really amazing, there seems to be a lot more froth inside the community i think external to the bitcoin community it's a who gives one fixture no one really cares about it back to back to that old old analogy so that that would probably be summing up in a nutshell that there's you know the bitcoiners who are in the space who are you know has renewed vigor and energy for it a sense of uh, validation that we're not all crazy that bitcoin's risen from the ashes mm -hmm. again and and then there's you know the broader market still doesn't quite comprehend that you know, where we are right now is, you know, on the verge of potentially one of, if not the best bull markets in Bitcoin's history. So it's a very bipolar market, but it's a bipolar world. So kind of fits. Totally. Yeah. And I think that's a great assessment. I mean, if, if we just cast our minds back to to the FTX collapse, I mean, it, it really was a devastating blow to, and I'm quote unquote, the industry and its reputation, because whether we like it or not, we sort of all tend to get lumped together. And the regulators certainly looked at that as an opportunity to really sort of pounce on Bitcoin as well. Uh, and we've also seen all sorts of strange things coming out of the regulator's mouth as recently as a week or two ago. And we'll get into that. But perhaps now let's talk about some of the more interesting things that we saw from a macro perspective. Let's talk about what happened in 2023, some of the bigger things in your mind that kind of stand out when you look back now. I think the US regional banking crisis was a huge one. I think Silicon Valley Bank, the other two sort of digital banks or digital native banks that fell over, that led to the buy the dip program that the Federal Reserve released. I think that was a huge thing that was papered over that didn't really get enough credit or enough attention. And what that really exposed on a broader sense was, I'll choose my words carefully here, because technically it's not because of, uh, of an accounting sleight of hand, but realistically, the US banking sector was insolvent. And that was all caused by the fact that you had the US 10-year go from 0.25 to 5% in less than 18 months. So that was the biggest thing that we had to deal with this year. In a 12-month period, it went from effectively nothing up to you know 5%. What that meant was, though, from the US banking perspective, was that all of these banks that were holding the US 10 years at you know par value, what they, you know, what they bought it for, uh, were probably... 20% underwater, maybe still close to that. Maybe not so much now because the rates have sort of come down a little bit. But at some point in time, they were 20% underwater on a risk-free asset. And this is where, you know, the biggest story, the dog that's, you know, the dog that's not barking is that, you know, we had a banking sector that had huge solvency issues and they papered over it. They basically said, look over here, you know, click, click, click over here. Don't look at the mess. Don't look at the mess. <laughs> you know, hypnosis. <laughs> this is not a problem. This is not a problem. And sure enough, it wasn't a problem. You know, everyone just got on with it. And what should have been, you know, a total re-rating of the US banking system, they pumped enough money in to solve that problem. And they basically made good on all the bonds that were under underwater. And it highlights probably in a broader and deeper sense, you know, the problem with what we have with man-made systems that, you know, they chose winners and losers there. They chose an accounting treatment that were, you know, you were able to use as a, a banking in the banking sector that, you know, you could basically leave that at par value, despite the fact that you're 20% out of the money on this. And it's a risk-free asset that you can leverage out the wazoo. And, and then you compare that to Bitcoin, which is considered a risky asset that gets marked to market at its lowest point since you purchased it. It's mm -hmm. a completely 
well, it's bipolar way of treating two different asset classes. And Bitcoin gets treated like the redheaded stepchild and the US bonds get treated in kick gloves and, you know, they can do no wrong. And even though when they're 20% underwater, the Federal Reserve will still make good on that and buy them at par value. So, I mean, that, that I think is the biggest story of the year from a macro perspective. It got nowhere near enough, I think, attention. And probably one of the reasons why it got not enough attention was because, you know, you, you put this into perspective, you know, we had Credit, Credit Suisse effectively fall over and get folded into, you know, another German bank this year. You know, that was a GSIB bank or globally systemic important bank, and that fell over. Yet the US banking sector basically got a free pass from the Federal Reserve and they were able to, you know, continue on keeping keeping on keeping on with um, that free pass. So as bad as the US was, I actually think it's probably worse in Europe. It was probably worse in the emerging markets because we were sort of in the start of the US US dollar wrecking ball, where, you know, because everyone's indebted in US dollars and you know they've moved rates from zero percent to five percent everyone wants to get their dollars back and have a risk-free return of five percent which i totally understand and that that i think is the biggest story of the year and a lot feels like all we talk about is macro now that that i think is the biggest thing because that has a re-rating and you know that's a, a domino effect on every other asset class because that's how you value every other asset based on the us risk-free rate that sets the risk free rate for the world. And that is how you calculate every other value of every other asset. So therein lies the the crux of the issue from a macro perspective this year. Okay. And then, I mean, it, it struck me though at the time that, although I didn't quite understand, it was quite evident that they were not going to let the free market allow this bank to fail. And what would have been the right thing to do if we cared about free market principles if we wanted to be a a genuinely free market economy would we have just let the depositors take the whack the oprah winfrey's of the world who didn't have fdic insurance was do you think there's any case to be made well a lot of these people were (laughs) systemically important people and we really didn't want to deal with a lot of the blowback because those people i think as i understand fdic insurance is only up to 250k yeah and so a lot of these, whether it was the uh, Silicon Valley companies or some of the sort of more well-connected celebrities, they would obviously have a lot more cash in there than that. So, I mean, is that a fair characterization in a sense? I mean, not necessarily that they protected the important celebrities, but that they literally just didn't allow it to fail uh, and essentially just intervened. That's probably just human nature, pain aversion. Don't yeah. deal with pain if you don't have to. So, you know, kick the can down the road and that fundamentally is what it was. I think anyone, the market behaved the way I expected the market to behave. You had the All In podcast guys, they were screaming from the from the rafters about, oh, this is a systemic failure and blah, blah, blah. They've got to step in. And sure enough, they stepped in. I'm like, funny that, like, you know, and they got their money out first and, you know, ring the alarm bells and causing all sorts of havoc. And would it have been better to let some of those banks fall? Probably yes, because... They're small banks and the fact that they're small will be, it serves as a forcing function for the other banks to start behaving and realise that they're not going to get bailed out. But the fact that they bailed them out and made everyone good, everyone whole, basically encourages more risk-taking from the bigger banks because they know that, well, if these shitty little banks are going to get covered off and you know squared away and they're protected, well, <laughs> what are we? <laughs> we really can't, can't lose here. So it actually encourages further risk-taking and I had a conversation with someone a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago now, maybe a month ago, and we were talking about Bitcoin becoming a global asset. And the question was posed, do you think that the risk of Bitcoin failing in the next couple of months after the ETF is bigger? Or do you think it's going to be better for Bitcoin to have you know a couple of years runway as an ETF before we have catastrophic failure with one of the banks? And they were on the side of, having a few years runway before it becomes a catastrophic failure would be a better thing for the markets. And I pushed back on that and said, no, I don't I don't believe that is the case. I actually think what you want to see is you want to see a catastrophic failure when Bitcoin is a $1 trillion asset. And you want to see these companies fail and fail very spectacularly in front of everyone to serve as a warning that this is an asset that you cannot fuck around with and that no one can bail you out from. And if you think about this, if it fails in the next six months, it's not going to be more than a $5 trillion asset, which in 
global terms is, you know, basically sweet FA of the entire market of assets out there. It'd, it'd be less than 1%. If you let it grow for the next five years or 10 years before it, you know, basically fails, what you're going to have then is it might be 25, 30, 50% of the total assets in the world. And then if it fails, that, that represents absolute anarchy in the system. And there's no way that, you know, any government can bail out that sort of catastrophic failure. So I want this to fail as quickly as possible. And then we can basically iterate faster from that. And it serves as a warning and a forcing function for the players in the space to make or to understand that this is something that is non-trivial and they can't muck around with it. Yes. I mean, so I guess that's one big theme then, uh, interventionism and some of the uh, the follies of it in terms of just kicking the can down the road and not actually resolving any of the inherent risks and weaknesses within the system. Uh, the other thing that I thought was also quite interesting, um, and you probably know a bit more about this, I'd love to hear your thoughts, is as far as I understand, 2022 was the worst year in many years in terms of performance for the 30-year treasury. And this is now the so-called risk-free rate. And that's it, it's almost the year when the 60-40 was completely obliterated. Yeah, give us your thoughts on that sort of, I mean, not only the portfolio composition and what that might mean going forward, but yeah, just tell us a little bit about the bonds performance over the, the last year. Been I horrible. keep saying 22, sorry. I'm referring to the last this year. year. Yeah. You know what? It's been horrible in a nutshell. And there's been some some reprieve from that performance or poor performance in the last month because you've seen yields come down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, however, as a whole, the last two years from you know long-term bonds perspective are the two worst years in the last hundred and you know bonds make up a a very interesting part of a portfolio that typically provides income for for retirees it provides peace of mind and that is meant to be the risk-free asset in the portfolio however the problem with bonds and particularly bond funds is that bonds are not risk-free and the double whammy with bonds in the last two years has been not only they're not risk-free but they don't provide any income either so it's a double whammy of like you know it's basically uh <laughs> what is it? Return-free risk. Yeah. You've got risk squared and no return. It's just an awful, awful plight. That said, and this is something that was really interesting to me, basically from the height of Bitcoin two years ago to, you know, to the drop down to where we are now, uh, if you compared that performance to the long-term bond, bond index, Bitcoin has been, uh, has done a better job of preserving value, even though it's nearly 50% off its highs or 40% off its all-time highs mm. than the long-term bond funds. So those long-term bond funds are off 50%, Bitcoin's off 40%. If I had, if we had had that conversation at the beginning of the year, like no way would we have believed that. And this is yeah. where, you know, one of the things that I, you know, struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis is to really help people understand the difference between risk and volatility. Now, Bitcoin is wildly volatile, but not very risky. And the assets that are comparable when thinking about this, when it, we, we look to bonds, I think bonds are wildly risky and up until two years ago they weren't very very volatile but now they are volatile and they're risky so mm. it's uh it's it's double dutch as far as you know all all the wrong trade-offs you're making to own those assets and this is where conversations that we've been having with clients up until say maybe 12 months ago all of the risks were associated with bitcoin versus the traditional assets bonds commodities stocks and property but now flip forward to where we are now, where rates are at 5%, we really need to have the, you know, the rental yields either go up dramatically or the cap rates come down, which is one and the same thing. So we need a readjustment in asset values. And I look at property and stocks and I think, you know, those asset classes are very tough to invest in at the moment. And so too are bonds because the risks that are inherent in the system where we are now, where there is inflation and inflation's volatile, interest rates are wildly volatile, and those, those asset values derive their value from the risk-free rate or calculating a premium on the risk-free rate. And now what we've had in the last 12 months or 18 months to 24 months is, you know, we've seen the risk-free rate go from 0% to 5%. And, you know, just as an example, in Sydney, we've had commercial office space used to be selling on a commercial yield of risk-free premium plus 4%. So they'd sell on about 4, 4.1% was A-grade commercial property. Fast forward to where we are now, interest rates have gone up to 4.35% in Australia. And those, those yields that those A-grade commercial properties are selling on now are 5.5%. But by my calculation, those property yields should be 
4.35%, which is the current rate, plus the 4%. So it should be closer to 8.5%, yet we're only mm. at 55 And I'm looking at this thinking, well, there's an awful lot of pain to come for someone. And, and the risk is inherent in those asset classes now, yet I look across to where Bitcoin is now. And, you know, investing is never in isolation. It's always, you know, comparing one asset to the other and the opportunity cost of one in hold, one and holding one versus the other. And all of a sudden now it's heavily skewed in favor of Bitcoin, whereas up until 12 months ago, it wasn't the case. Sure. Let's just uh, let's un let's unpick this volatility and risk are kind of have they've tended to be con like conflated and I don't know if that is um, part of modern portfolio theory the Harry Markowitz type way of thinking where you've got sort of a distribution of returns and the further away you get from the mean the more volatile it is um, the more risky it is by you know by definition is this so you're saying that's not quite the case and I think. It, it's an interesting take. And I tend to agree because when I look at Bitcoin relative to these other assets, I go, I wouldn't want to be in commercial real estate for the money in the world. There's massive execution risk and vacancies and maintenance and taxes and God knows what else. Let's just, let's unravel that little story there. Cause um, I think people will be quite keen to hear it if they don't know it already. About risk fee volatility. Yeah. Just how like something that is volatile is not necessarily risky. Yeah. And vice versa too. So with Bitcoin, we have a very unique position that personally, it's a misunderstood technology. So I put Bitcoin as a technology, not, not a money or an asset. It's a technology first. And then we've ascribed you know, asset, asset values and a monetary network above the technology. And because it's a technology first, you know, a lot of people have huge difficulties understanding technology and you know the benefits of it and what it can bring. And probably no greater example than uh, Bitcoin's number one marketer, Paul Krugman, talking about the fax machine uh, and the internet, you know, will be dead because we've got fax machines. So it, it's grossly misunderstood. And this is where humans have a proclivity to ascribe much more risk to things that they don't understand. And that's purely driven by our most basic of nature, fight and flight. And if we don't understand it, and we think there's a risk, well, ascribe a really high uh, risk to it and run as fast as you can because that means you get to talk about it the next day because the consequences for being wrong and just sticking around and seeing if that gorilla is hungry and going to rip your arms off is uh, fatal. So I think, you know, our little brains have been programmed over hundreds of thousands of years to behave like that and investing is no different. And this is where for Bitcoin, because it's so difficult to understand, there are so many, oh, there are so many areas that it draws in that you need to be proficient in to really understand Bitcoin it's very difficult to understand. It takes an enormous amount of work. And at the same time that it takes an enormous amount of work, you need to forget what you've known in traditional markets to actually understand this as a technology first and then think about what it looks like from a, a monetary network and an asset value perspective. So from a risk perspective, people ascribe way more risk to Bitcoin than what I ascribe to it because I've spent you know over, well, probably close to 15,000 hours now staring at this problem and trying to figure it out and understand it. And from my understanding and the time that I've spent looking at it, I look at this and I think, you know, if I had to be a betting man, the number one thing I'd bet on as far as a sure bet goes would be that the sun will rise tomorrow. That is my number one bet that if I could have my bet, that would be the bet. My number two bet would be that basically a Bitcoin block will continue to be mined every 10 minutes. And that's a bet I'd be happy to have as my second best bet. So if... You do the work and you get to that point in time, you understand that Bitcoin, although it's wildly volatile because that's the price that we attach on top of the network, the risk of Bitcoin failing is very, very low because of its decentralized nature. And this is where going deep down that rabbit hole, the decentralized nature of, of Bitcoin and the network that it is means that it's going to be far more secure than anything else. And the problem is, is that, you know, we haven't been familiar as a species with decentralized networks. So... It's very difficult for us to understand. And then from a volatility perspective, you know, that's putting risk aside. Then volatility, people think that volatility is, is a problem. But volatility is the feature, not the bug, because volatility allows you to go up 170% in a year and still think that it could have gone up more by a lot more. And, you know, probably we're sitting here looking at what lies ahead and thinks, and I don't know about you, but I think that there's far more upside left in the next two years than what we've seen this year. So that's volatility being friendly to the upside. And at the same time, 
you don't get volatility to upside with having some drawdowns as well. And this is where people typically conflate the risk and volatility because they think when things drop that it's dead and the bubble has burst and there's no second go round at it. But as long as Bitcoin keeps working, people will understand what it is, more entrants will come back to the market and the price will come back up. So I don't think we've seen the end of, you know, 70, 80% drawdowns. I just think, um, you know, they're going to be a continued feature of the system because in order to get to the values that we think it can achieve, you need to have massive volatility. It's just skewed to the upside. So if yeah. you've got a long enough time frame, you don't have to worry about the, the drawdowns. You just hold on for another four years. And not only does it go back to the previous high, it'll go a lot further past it. Yeah, and I, I don't know where I heard this recently, but it's almost like someone described Bitcoin as like a venture bet on digital gold. And I guess when you're involved in venture capital, you've got some sort of edge and you go, I actually understand the space and I'm playing in it. You know, whether it's like, you know, like uh, my brother-in-law's, uh, and my brother-in-law and his family invested in a copper mine or an iron mine or something like that in Sierra Leone. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing with mucking around there? Like, what do you know about that space? You know, and to me, it felt like just gambling. But if I was actually like really proficient in that space and I fully understood the environment and I understood like the operations and the processing and the government rules and, the you know, all that kind of jazz, I could actually say, you don't understand. This is actually a really good deal. And it's actually the opposite of risky. I look at investing in property you know, down the coast is highly risky. So I guess it's it's ultimately a question of perspective. And maybe it's not just limited to the way that Bitcoiners think about risk and volatility, because you could also say the same about a lot of other sectors. But yeah, no, okay, I think that's a, that's a good sort of characterization. Now, if we reflect on the year that's been, bear in mind, we are still, in, well, you and I are chatting in 23, but this is going to be coming out in 24. Let's chat a little bit about some of the Bitcoin specific stuff that we saw, some of the metrics, some of the highs, some of the lows, um, some of the notable sort of pieces of information that emerged uh, in 2023 that you think are worth chatting about. Oh, you know what? For me, I think probably the highlight, which doesn't really get a lot of credit, but it serves that function of ensuring that Bitcoin is going to continue working, is what we saw with the hash rate. You know, we're at all-time high hash rate. We're nearly 500 exahashes. Back in 2021, April 2021, the hash rate, total network hash rate got went from 186 down to 84 uh, exahash. And now... Post-China. Post-China, yep. yeah. So it got right down to 86, uh, 84 exahash, and it effectively halved the network. And since April 21, so what's that, two and a half years, just over, we've seen the network grow from 86 exahash to 500 exahash. So it's gone up five and a half times. That is insane because, you know, for years and years, we were talking about the fact that we would get to a point where the, you know, the hash rate won't be able to grow that much because in order to deliver, or it won't be able to grow proportionally that quickly because in order to grow the network that much, you will have to find that much extra electricity. And you just don't have gigawatts of electricity lying around unused for Bitcoin miners to turn up and just plug their machines in and start going. And in addition to that, you, you know, you, it takes a lot of mining equipment to to move the exahash from 86 to 500. I mean, that's just absolutely mega. And mm. I think that's a big thing that doesn't get much credit. I think, you know, coming into the halving, we're going to see, you know, miner FUD come up again. But, you know, a big thing that happened in Bitcoin this year that I think um, I'd love to get your views on it because no one's better versed than you talking about altcoins and why Bitcoin only, but, you know, ordinals, you know, twice this year has basically come into the market and totally clogged the network and absolutely wreaked havoc. I'd, I'd love to get your yes. take on, on oh, ordinals. It, so you know, I think that's been a big thing for Bitcoin this year. It it really, it caught me by surprise. And, you know, I, I was chatting to Daz and the idiots about it. And essentially what I said was like, I never, I'm one of these guys who's a Bitcoiner who never bothered to look at uh, mempool.space. I never bothered. I mean, it's like, it doesn't interest me, to be honest with you. Like, I'm not technical, just more interested in the macro and whatnot. And it forced me to look at it. And then suddenly, you know, literally from the bush bash, mm -hmm. went from 45 V bytes per sat, if that's the right metric. And now we're running into hundreds and hundreds. And it's actually just, 
incredibly expensive to take your coins off exchange now. And you go, wow, now I've actually got a real problem. Not, not only do I have this whole sort of UTXO issue that suddenly now front and center of a lot of Bitcoiners minds. And I don't think it's something that a lot of people are, I guess a lot of people who hold Bitcoin, but don't necessarily like aren't necessarily Bitcoiners, you know, they could Bitcoin investors. I don't think that's something that's even on their radar, but it's like, it suddenly dawned on me how serious a problem that could be if we don't scale up properly. So yeah, it really surprised me. At the end of the day, I'm a free market guy. I don't care what they want to do with the, with the blockchain. You know, if if you're stupid enough to pay the the fees, then go for it. I think in the end, it's all going to be worth absolutely fuck all. And, you know, you're going to have to generate something of real value. I'll, I'll give you like a an example of how I think this will end. During my early phase of Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. I was very much into, and I still am, of course, into UFC and MMA. And at that time, uh, the UFC had partnered up with Crypto.com. And suddenly all these NFTs are coming out. And I was like, NFTs are bullshit, okay? But what if, what if I got the first ever NFT of this particular fight? Okay, it's the first round. It was the first round that it was ever done. And I was like, this could be worth something one day. I bought it for $40 US. I got offered 200 a few weeks later. I was like, no boy, I'm holding this shit. Well, I decided a few weeks ago to just try and log into my shitcoin <laughs> crypto account. And would you believe it, but they're trading at $2. <laughs> you can't even get rid of the things. <laughs> and it's on a blockchain called Kronos. And I was like, what are the prospects that Kronos is going to be around in the next decade? I'll tell you about zero. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the same will happen with Bitcoin. Like I just can't imagine that. There's no serious people, I think, that are doing inscriptions, ordinals, JPEGs, whatever. But I think what's really interesting, I'd love to get your take here, and I saw this the other day, is if this is where people want to play in the, you know, in the NFT space, and then you want to do the fastest transactions known to man, Ethereum is in this middle ground where it's actually just serving nobody. It's not ultrasound money, and it's certainly not facilitating you know, like the NFT world and, oh, so it's not doing the NFT. It's not doing the money. It's not doing fast transactions. You've got Tron and you've got Solana. And it's just like, it just has, it's got no identity because all they've been doing is manipulating this project to be able to optimize the returns for the initial investors. And I see today, uh, even Vitalik, he cashed out like, you know, 50,000 or something ETH. So, you know, it's just, I don't know. What do you think of that? It's one of my favorite things to do, but I don't want to gloat or be too excited about just the misery that that's imparting on a lot of people because I agree with you. I don't think Ethereum has a, it doesn't have a unique selling point now. It's caught in a middle ground between being a decentralized, it says it's decentralized, but it's not. You can roll back the chain. So, you know, it's either decentralized or it's not. And because it's not Bitcoin, it's not decentralized. And then the problem that they're facing is twofold. Not only do they have competitors offering cheaper transactions, quicker transactions, you know, more throughput, those other chains can do that because no one cares about centralization. They're like, we don't care. If we want decentralization, we'll have Bitcoin. If we want censorship resistant money, we'll go to Bitcoin. If we want to make sure that our assets can't be seized, we'll go to Bitcoin. Everything else is just fairy dust, fugazi. It's a way to extract Bitcoin from you and uh, sell your pipe dream and go and get more Bitcoin for selling that dream. So I feel sorry for Ethereum because I think a lot of people, you know, spend a lot of time, energy and effort in that. And, you know, they're not going to be really rewarded for it. I think the ETH to Bitcoin ratio is just going to bleed out to mm -hmm. Bitcoin. It might have some pumps along the way, but, you know, if we're talking in five years time, 10 years time, I think it'll be sub 0.01. So the Ethereum price won't be 1% of what Bitcoin's is. So the other chain, Solana, I mean, despite all of the problems that that had in the last 12 months, 24 months, they had to turn the network off three times. Still don't <laughs> care. <laughs> Fast transactions. That's and that's it. About. Yeah. So no one cares. It's just the, you know, this is the new pump and dump on it. And, you know, you need, yeah, I, I think it's important to have competitors to Bitcoin to, you know, identify what, what the real benefits of Bitcoin are, because, you know, unless you have something to compare it to, like making an investment between bonds and Bitcoin, all of a sudden, you know, you can overlook how good Bitcoin is. So it serves as a great reminder that we can uh, 
have a great asset, but it's only shown how great it is because the competitors to Bitcoin are just so goddamn awful. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, exactly. And it's just to me that there's no second best when you look at like Sailor said this before. He goes when they talk about the Bitcoin dominance ratio, he goes, "It's bullshit." It's <laughs> you, you know you you don't you got to compare it against other proof of work tokens, and yeah. there it's like ninety eight percent dominance. You know, so more. Yeah, yeah, so or 99. So it's like, you know, uh, at the end of the day, like on a long enough time horizon, we'll all kind of be going, I told you so. And in the interim, a lot of uh, retail is going to get wrecked. And a lot of grifters are going to get enriched. But it is what it is. The The interesting thing about the ordinals is that I was listening to Marcus Dent, not Mar Marty Bent. You know, that's his real name, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> I didn't know that until recently. So he was chatting to uh, a fella and on his pod, and he was saying that the Bitcoin, uh, the earnings that miners were getting today, even at the price, was greater than at the peak of the bull market last time, due to all this garbage. So it's actually yep. been really beneficial to miners from that perspective. But yeah, I, I guess that has been a big surprise. And I think you know, the hash rate just doesn't get enough coverage. And it is quite remarkable. And it's something I chatted to your brother about. And we're thinking, what the hell's going on? Like, what is happening behind the scenes? Why are people competing so heavily in what is an incredibly competitive space already? And it's hard not to believe that there are not nation states driving some of this whether they are being public or not i have you got a sense of what you think might be some of the main reasons why you know the hash rate is going through the roof and continues to hit new time all-time highs here good question i think i think there's been an improvement in the bitcoin miners so the actual technology of the machines has improved mm -hmm. like reasonably sub quite substantially so that that's a huge thing but you know the amount of power that they're drawing down now you know, to go from 86 or 84 to, you know, 500 plus exahash in the space of three years is insane, the amount of power that's required to do that. So you need to think, you know, that amount of power attributed to the network and focused on Bitcoin mining, uh, it's hard not to think that it's a nation state in some way, shape or form focusing on that. And probably I would have thought best guess would be it'd probably be Bitmain producing really good machines and being able to put them to work because the CCP's had a change of heart. You know, it basically left a big hole and these CCP's flip-flopped so many times they made a South Park meme out of it. I don't know if you've seen that or not. But no, is... I haven't. Oh, my goodness. It's one of the greatest. <laughs> it was about <laughs> circa 2017 and, you know, I, I won't ruin it for everyone, but we should put it in the show notes. It's, okay, I'll go and look that one up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I suppose yeah, there's that, and then you know at the at the Bitcoin Bush Bash, I had a a chat with old uh, Checkmate about some of the stuff that's going on, and you know at a high level, some of the other things that we're seeing right now is far fewer coins in circulation, basically on exchanges than we've seen in years gone by. Apparently, used to be around two. Well, you know, something put 2.7 to 3 million. Now it's closer to two. We're also seeing that 70% of holders haven't moved in a year. So we can call them hodlers, if you like. You might say some of those people just don't want to sell because they're underwater uh, to an extent. Or But now that it's 12 months, you could say, hmm, maybe those those people are actually in profit. So I'm, maybe, maybe there's people who've got conviction. So... I don't know. Have you got some comments around those metrics? Do you think that the, the psychological aspect has changed? Do you think people are actually grokking the idea that the game here is to hold it for long term? It's not to trade. And um, that's just, you know, and take it into your own custody. Is, do you think that message is maybe infiltrated to an extent? I, firstly, I'd just like to say James Check, Checkmatey is <laughs> such a great asset to this space. Just a savant level genius and i love his work i'm really happy he's on our team and um his presentation at the bush bash was second to none i would have driven from sydney just to hear that half an hour <laughs> it was outstanding and um you know he does so much for the space I, I i think those metrics are probably a precursor to one of two things and 
we'll probably talk about this in a second, but one of them is I think there is that narrative shift that people are understanding that this is really a store of value. Although it you know has been wildly volatile, it's a long-term store of value that people can get behind. So I think that message is is happening. And I think it's a precursor to the capital that is about to enter the market. And the capital that's about to enter the market is very different to everything that's entered so far. And I'm basically talking about the ETFs. And we're going to see money go into that, that ETF and they're going to lock up Bitcoin for a long time. And those holders don't care about trading and buying and selling Bitcoin. They're just going to buy it. It's going to be 1% to 2%, maybe even 5% of their portfolio. And they're going to come back in five years and look at it and go, well, how's that Bitcoin doing? And they're going to hold it for five years. And the capacity of the 20 ETFs that are you know, in situ at the moment about to have their, their you know, approvals done has the capacity to take those existing 2 million coins straight off the exchange. So I think there's going to be, um, it's just a, it's a, not only is it a narrative, it's a different, it's a different buyer who's buying Bitcoin now. And we're only seeing, I think, the precursor to what those new buyers look like and how they behave. So I think we're going to split this market into pre and post ETF and the, the buyers to come are going to look very different to the buyers who have been here today. Absolutely. Are you talking about sort of sneaky early adopter type institutional investors who are getting in now quietly because they've done the work and they've figured out and they've seen that the sort of correlation between Bitcoin and the NASDAQ isn't quite as close as it used to be and that it's sort of outperformed every other asset class over the last 12 months and finally kind of been recognized across the world and they're going, okay, this thing's here to stay. Is that kind of what we're, is that what you're sort of implying with what some of the behavior might be right now? Never mind the wall of money, the big money that could come with the ETF. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I'll share with you a story. We had VJ come and talk to our clients, VJ Boy Patty, who just a great human being, uh, all around nice guy and um, just a fabulous educator. In April last year, so April 2022, give or take, uh, he came and had a chat to our clients. The question I posed to him was, what is the greatest risk for Bitcoin? He broke that down into two things and was very quick to, quick to clarify. He said, the number one risk for Bitcoin is that a major exchange goes down. Now, this was a full eight months before FTX blowing up and mm -hmm. sending the world into a cataclysm. And you know that is just the, the level that VJ operates on, just so far ahead of everyone else. And he was very quick to say that despite the fact that that will cause absolute havoc in the market, it'll be hugely detrimental to Bitcoin. The network itself will remain unaffected and Bitcoin itself will remain unaffected, but the public perception will be affected and it could be a long lasting, it could be a long lasting effect where people are put off Bitcoin and investing in Bitcoin for, you know, two to five years. What's really encouraged me over the last 12 months and what I've seen is, despite the fact that we had a catastrophic failure with FTX, which was probably the second largest exchange in the world at the time, and it did somewhere between 10 and 20% of daily global trade in Bitcoin and crypto, in less than 12 months, the market shrugged it off and said, Bitcoin's still working and Bitcoin's up 150% since that happened. That is a huge endorsement for what's mm -hmm. happening. And this is, you know, back to the narrative shift 12 months ago, oh, world's falling in, Bitcoin's dead and the rest of it. And fast forward to where we are now, excuse me, you know, coins off exchange. The last three years, we've gone from 3 million to 2 million. And you can't help but start wondering and thinking what that's going to do from a, you know, from a price perspective when we've got the supply of Bitcoin on exchange literally going down. So all of a sudden it sets us up for a really nice year ahead. Wow. Absolutely. And that makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's really exciting to see the resilience is something that I could say would characterize Bitcoin in 2023. Endless amount of FUD, you could say, maybe reducing in volume, some of the environmental stuff I've also seen has continues, but I think it's losing steam. And maybe mm. I'd like to touch on that in a sec. But yeah, overall, I think if you if you look at just the way institutions, family offices, high net worths are looking at Bitcoin now, given what it's done over the last year, I think the word that would come to mind for me would be resilience and staying power. And this thing has proven to be very distinct from crypto. 
yeah. the dirty C word in the Warburton household. So the second most offensive C word. No. <laughs> Maybe it's the most. <laughs> you know, it's funny. That resilience comes back to risk and volatility. You know, because it's so resilient, there's very low risk to it. But people don't understand the resilience of Bitcoin. So, hey, you know what I want to bring up with you as one yes. of the sort of key talking points this last 12 months was the environmental fund. And I don't know if you remember the whole Greenpeace Change the Code campaign. Funded by um, Ripple. I know. Yeah. Five, five million bucks got them that, that campaign, which had an effect for maybe 24 hours. And now every Bitcoin has forgotten about it. But what it did do is it sowed the seed for Daniel Batten's work, and he's been instrumental this year in effectively turning that 180 on a dime and actually changing the whole narrative on Bitcoin from being really bad for the environment to being really good through methane emissions. And, and that's been a huge turnaround. And I, I can't help but think, to me, this year, I think, you know, year in review, the biggest thing that happened this year for me is Larry Fink and Mohammed El Arian. And it's going to take another five or 10 years to really understand the tectonic shift that happened this year with those two in particular. But I thought it'd be really important to cover off on that. Yes. Mm, Let's up, go in, up until maybe two months ago, you had Larry Fink absolutely sticking it to Bitcoin and telling us how awful it was. It was horrible and it's for fraudsters and it's money laundering and all the rest of it. Anyway, he puts in an ETF. Now, all of a sudden, he works for us. He's selling Bitcoin. And I take this with a grain of salt, but he's out there on CNBC talking about Bitcoin being being a flight to quality. And I'm like, hmm, isn't that interesting? Now, take that with a grain of salt because he's the world's greatest salesman. And he's got something to sell us. But what is bigger than Larry in this this, this incident anyway, is a couple of weeks later, Mohamed El Arian, the ex-head of PIMCO, the largest bond trader or bond fund in the world, and now head of, uh, what is he, Chief Investment Officer for Alliance Bernstein, a mega corporation, which to my understanding doesn't have an ETF. He was on CNN talking about the fact that the people he talks to, and the people he talks to are basically every hedge fund on earth, every sovereign wealth fund, every major central bank, they're the type of people he talks to on a daily, monthly, quarterly basis. And he was saying that in his conversations that he's having, stocks and Bitcoin are considered safe haven assets. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> come, come, come again? What was that? Safe haven assets? And so the, the reason why this is such a monumental or a tectonic shift is I can tell you that as an investment advisor, when we first started talking about Bitcoin, you know, we had to you know, tread on eggshells. We had to talk about it as being a total, a major risk. You could lose all capital that you put into it. So we were comfortable talking about Bitcoin being a 1% to 2% allocation. And that was back in 2016. And there were a whole host of disclaimers and education that we put clients through to actually get that 1% to 2% into Bitcoin. Anyway, the reason why I bring that up is because the advisors who are entering the space or the ETFs that are going to be serving the advisors in the space now are going to be starting with those conversations with their clients. Hey, this is a nascent asset class. We want to have exposure to it. It's a new asset class. This could do wonderful things for your portfolio. It could juice returns a little bit. Let's put in 1% to 2%. Now, that's where they'd start prior to those two conversations being understood. And I talked to a couple of mates who are financial planners, and I said, did you see what Mohammed El Arian said? And both of them said, no, don't know what you're talking about. I said, listen to this for a thing. And the reason why that's so important is because when you have Bitcoin classified as a, you know, a flight to safety, a safe haven asset, flight to quality, safe haven asset, sorry, that shifts the conversation for the investment advisors, the wealth advisors from having a one to 2% allocation to having a five to 20% allocation. That's a very different weighting to a client's portfolio. And in the last 12 months, we've seen BlackRock, BlackRock reports release where they talked about having the ideal allocation of Bitcoin was 86%. Personally, I think that was a beat up with a Bitcoin and just <laughs> putting that on a letterhead, but you know, it's fun to think about, but the, the real impetus and the importance of those two people talking about it, all of a sudden, two of the most respected figures in finance who literally have the ability to shift trillions of dollars with the words they say, are now talking about Bitcoin being a safe haven asset. And that moves the conversation for the advisors from a 1% to 2% allocation to a 10 to 20% quite easily. Wow. That is absolutely obscene to think of. And it really does feel as <clears> if <throat> this year is the year of institutionalization when it comes to Bitcoin. Uh, maybe 24 will be bigger, but 21 had so much promise 
you know, Tesla was sticking on their balance sheet and Square and MicroStrategy. And I, you know, I thought corporate treasuries would be piling on, never obviously materialized. Elon got soft and sold and promised to buy back when it was over 50% uh, green, which he's failed to do subsequently. Maybe he's short on cash. He wants to use that for X. But yeah, it is quite fascinating to see. And, you know, it's hard for me to actually describe properly, but it, it, the sentiment just really feels like there's this enormous weight and significance coming from the institutional world that's just building up like a little bit of a tsunami. And we're only going to see it in, you know, in the years to come. But this groundwork, this horrific bear market that we have endured, and now we're sort of at the back end, and now we're running in the early stage of the bull run, it just feels as if it's now prime time for institutionalization of Bitcoin. And that will come with some risks and some benefits. And hopefully we can chat about that in the next episode where we talk about the year ahead. But yeah, what a great year it's been there. Let's touch on the ESG thing before we round this one out there. So we can talk a little bit about ESG and then I just want to check and see, do you have any other sort of FUD things that are floating around that you think are sticky, that are problematic, that perhaps were new in 23 or that try to rear their ugly heads and, and got quashed very rapidly? I mean, ESG was a big one and you described how Daniel Batson very successfully has been able to challenge that narrative we saw kpmg release something it was a small office of theirs but say something about how bitcoin can play its part in the transition to renewables and i was like what is this one of the big four that are saying that so yeah what what other sort of fud have you you know got sort of uh in your crosshairs that you when you think back on this year is there any other fud that you would think about uh i think probably around ordinals where people talk about the network being too slow, too congested, and the fee market so high that it'll render it useless. Mm -hmm. And actually it doesn't, because if they're not saying that the network's too slow, it's bloated, it's congested, and you know it, it doesn't serve a purpose now. If it's not that, then they talk about the fact that there's no fee market for Bitcoin, so the security of the network's going to be compromised. So people flip-flop between those two, and I think both of them are FUD. You know, this, <laughs> how to solve high, high fees is high fees and you know they'll run out of money and then that'll fall in a heap and it'll probably be you know in the next month and now we'll have you know sat fee bites drop dramatically and we'll be able to get cheap transactions again or relatively cheap transactions so I, I think there is a constant renewal of previous arguments that have been handled for years um, and solved but because there's so many new people to bitcoin you know they hear this you know fud for the first time and the hair falls out and they think, oh my goodness, this is the end of Bitcoin. It's like, you know, this is the responsibility of Bitcoiners who have been here a while and understand that to just take them by the hand and say, don't worry, none of that's going to happen. We've been here before. Nothing like that will happen. And let me show you some examples of what they were talking about before. And, you know, the example of China banning Bitcoin and, you know, the US banning Bitcoin. I'm like, you know, the US isn't banning Bitcoin. They can try all they want. You know, China tried it and I had a conversation with a, a mate of Mike and I's who had an office in in China, and we talked. To, I talked to him about you know what happens if the US tries to ban it. And this is probably going back eighteen months. And he said, "Well, China tried to ban it, and they're far more authoritarian than the US, and they were unsuccessful. And they flip flopped and flip flopped. Like, how do you reckon the US is going to do it?" And I said, "Oh, okay. Well, in light of that, there's no chance." So I just think maybe that fee, you know, the fees, high fees, and the rest of it is. A bit of fud, but at the same time, it's sparked a whole lot more conversation around layer two initiatives. Uh, it's given life to Liquid, which has now started to get a bit of a run on. That's been a dead network for nearly six years now. And all of a sudden, people are talking about it because the limitations of the Lightning Network are, are realized in a high fee market that to open a channel, you've still got to do an on chain transaction on layer one. Whereas with um, Liquid Network, you just basically peg in once and that's it. So um, there's a lot less fees attached to the liquid network. So I, I think this is good. You know, we're going to see innovations happen on the back of it because, you know, innovation really happens when constraints are put on the network. So we don't see that until that happens. Exactly. And and that's what really makes it so resilient, you know, after all, much like a, an immune system is built through repeated exposure to all sorts of colds and flu. Bitcoin just seems to get stronger no matter what you throw at it. And 
it's almost becoming undeniable. I mean, the idea that you can ban it is just totally absurd. Like, what are you going to do? Ban mining? Like, go try that. I mean, you know, they're wild miners in China and that is an authoritarian regime. I mean, they're pretty organized. And then you go, well, you're going to, you're going to ban people from running a node? Okay, even if you could somehow penetrate an entire country and say you're not running a node, you can just switch it off around the world? Absolutely not. So you can't do anything. It doesn't they matter. Try, they can try and think they're going to and... This is where you know the FUD's glorious for people who have been here a little little bit of time to understand that there's very little that can can damage Bitcoin from a long term perspective. And I'd imagine, Pete, that's something that you have conversations with when you're chatting to your clients. And it's one of the first things I'd be asking as somebody who's coming to the space new is kind of what are some of the things that can go wrong? And I'd have all those standard you know questions like can governments ban it? Okay, and then you've got to explain you know, this and that around decentralization and why does it use so much energy as much as country X? I mean, the World Economic Forum said it would be consuming all the world's energy by 2020, I think it was, or whatever it was, and it never actually came to, you know, fruition. So, yeah, I'd imagine you're having conversations with clients on the regular around those things, particularly if they're new. Yeah, we are, but I try and avoid that because I'd like to tell them up front that, you know, the worst thing that can happen here is you lose everything it goes to zero. And once you've formed a base layer that everything can go to zero or anything, including Bitcoin, can go to zero, that allows you to have a meaningful conversation and move past all of the FUD. And rather than dealing with individual specific issues around, oh, what about mining? What about China? What about the US government? What about this legislation? What that? It totally moves you past those conversations because you've just told them you, they can lose everything. So it's like, there's nothing more to discuss. You can lose everything. So all that's right, a now great that way to do it. That, that, that just gets you to the next conversation which you need to have, which is now that we've discussed you can lose everything, we need to understand what weighting you need to have knowing that you can lose everything. And that's really the main game. So I think, you know, in light of what uh, Larry Fink and Mohammed El Arian said, the, the real thing that's come out of this year from the finance sector perspective is that there used to be career risk talking about Bitcoin. Now there's going to be career risk not talking about Bitcoin. That is a massive shift. Absolutely. So, and that's and that probably is one of the main takeaways I think for for me this year. Notwithstanding the fact that it's performed incredibly well, and um, it's got my juices flowing once again. The, the the you know when you're not actually building anything, Pete. You know I'm not a developer. I'm not doing anything. It, those those bear markets can be quite challenging. But then I did notice it just stuck at like 30k for like I don't know how long. And it was what, like a stable coin. And it was like, wow, okay, it's sort of forming a bit of a, a base here. And it's been really encouraging to see what's happened over the last little while. And yeah, I think those who've been in it for long enough are now starting to see sort of, I guess, the fruits of their of their labor, as it were, in terms of putting in the time and worrying about it and thinking about it. And yeah, it's been it's been such an interesting year. It's been a big year for me launching a podcast and i've been really blessed to have so many good guests and really grateful to have had a lot of awesome conversations with you pete so thanks very much for that looking back this will be like a turning point in my life i'm sure and i'm i feel like i'm just hitting my stride and 2024 i told my wife before we we got on it's going to be cooking i'm just so pumped so yeah thanks for coming on the ride man Look at you, South African Ricky Martin. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> I hope that doesn't catch. I hope it doesn't catch. Oh, I really do. I hope oh it catches my... a lot. Gosh, well, no. On a, on a serious note, I think you're doing a great job. It's been fun to watch your progression with this totally smash it out of the park. And I really value the fact that we get to catch up pretty regularly and chinwag about all this stuff. Um, and... You know, you might not be a developer, but I think hosting a podcast is of critical importance to have another voice out there and reaching a target market that might not otherwise hear about Bitcoin. And arguably one of the most important things all of us can do in Bitcoin, if we're not, say, on the developer front, is to help educate. And that's a responsibility for everyone who's in Bitcoin. And, you know, hats off to you for doing it. So thanks yeah. for what you do. Look, uh, if, if it wasn't for a podcast, I'd be talking to myself. And so that'd be a problem. So, yeah. <laughs> it's feel like it's uh it's my uh psychotherapy anyway let's wrap this one up Pete. thanks so much for your time